the predictive value or the relationship between high cholesterol levels and your risk of having a heart attack aren't that clear for a lot of people. It's not a great predictor. Yeah. Um, many people who have at least 50%, according to at least one study of people who have heart attacks, have no high cholesterol at the time of their heart attack, no history of high cholesterol. So we really want to keep that in perspective because in a, to a certain extent, hmm. so much focus on cholesterol may have led us astray in the fight against heart disease and certainly is not helping us focus on the, the broader picture or other things that contribute to um, you know, poor heart health. Ultimately, the endothelium is this living lining and it's what we do to, that will help that um, in terms of heart health when there is an issue or a buildup somewhere, we might be better off asking, well, why did the endothelium fail us? Why didn't it do its job in keeping that area clean and healthy? What perhaps did it need that it wasn't getting or which factors um, exacerbated um, that or impaired it from being able to do its job? Welcome back, folks, to the Healthy Habit Podcast, episode number 97, almost at the triple digits here. And I'm excited for this one in our Natural Factors monthly check-in. Um, Dr. Kate Rayum, folks, is back. And if you're an avid listener to the podcast and previous radio uh, show on 1100 KFNX, Dr. Kate Rayum has been with us and educating us ever since the last couple years. Author and, not, author and naturopathic doctor, Dr. Kate Rayum is a graduate and former faculty member of CCNM, the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine. Dr. Kate lectures internationally on many topics related to health and wellness, and she's a frequent guest on radio and television across North America, just like this show. She's the author of the best-selling book, Vitamin K2 and the Calcium Paradox, How a Little-Known Vitamin Could Save Your Life. Thank you, Dr. Kate, for coming back on. Hi, Dr. Diane. Great to be back. Okay, well, let's dive right into it. Thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be with us here today. We're talking move over cholesterol, a completely new take on heart health, which is perfect because we're in heart health month here, February 2024. So how important is it to talk about cholesterol, you know, instead of just looking at that total cholesterol number, what else should we have on our radar? And yeah, tell us about your thoughts on this. Mm -hmm. Well, we know that, of course, Heart disease is a leading killer of both men and women in North America. So this yeah. is such an important topic. And yet so much of the focus for so long has been on cholesterol, um, even to the point that I think a lot of people think cholesterol is the cause of heart disease or cholesterol, if it's high, will you know, clog right. up your arteries like a pipe and that's the problem. And it really, you know, the, the predictive value or the relationship between high cholesterol levels and your risk of having a heart attack aren't that clear for a lot of people. It's not a great predictor. Yeah. Um, many people who have at least 50%, according to at least one study of people who have heart attacks, have n no high cholesterol at the time of their heart attack, no history of high cholesterol. So we really want to keep that in perspective because in a, to a certain extent, hmm. so much focus on cholesterol may have led us astray in the fight against heart disease and certainly is not helping us focus on the, the broader picture or other things that contribute to um, you know, poor heart health. Right. And what would some of those then be? That's where we can like talk, look even more under the rate, under the hood, if you will, in a mm -hmm. car analogy, like the inflammatory markers, blood sugar, the person's blood pressure and weight. Is that some things that you're referring to? Definitely. Blood pressure is extremely important. Weight yeah. is extremely important. You know, lifestyle, whether you're sedentary or active. And it's not that we would completely throw cholesterol out the window. Exactly. Because you don't want you don't want someone to you don't want someone to be at four hundred and fifty on a total cholesterol, correct? Exactly, <laughs> that's right. And and even more importantly, if that cholesterol becomes oxidized, that's yeah, when it really yeah. becomes problematic. And often that's not even being checked for, right? So yeah. lipoprotein A, which is a measure of oxidized cholesterol. I know this maybe sounds a little technical for some of your listeners, but they love it. That's they a, love it. Yeah. Well, yeah. this and this is an easy test that can be done along with your regular blood work. Uh, you know, you don't have to special order it, for example, and um, that's a much better predictor. High levels of oxidized cholesterol is, is much more correlated uh, with um, heart disease incidents and events. Yeah. And so that's something to keep in mind. So um, not as much focus necessarily depending on the person, where their level's at. You know, I, I, 
I have a lot of people who will come and ask me, you know, they've been told that their cholesterol levels are just slightly high. And so immediately they've been um, suggested that they go on a cholesterol lowering right. medication <laughs> and they're concerned about that. And the fact is, is that cholesterol, you know, the good cholesterol is also high. The HDL is high. The ratio is good and it's not oxidized. Um, and that's really not that concerning. And so people don't need to be necessarily as alarmed and they can look at all the other things they can do to support heart health. That's very interesting. And then tell us then about, that's, I'm glad you highlighted that. There's people that have had heart attacks, a lot, a high percentage of people that have heart attacks did not have high cholesterol before that. You said, and did I hear that correctly? Definitely, yes. Um, up to 50% of people who have uh, heart attacks have never had high cholesterol. Um, so, yeah, so that means now that means that um, if you have your cholesterol tested and it's not high, that you're not automatically in the clear or have no risk for heart disease. Yes. So that's when even more important to look at all of those other factors, like you mentioned already, inflammation, yes. blood sugar levels. Are you having the right amounts of nutrients to keep your arteries from being calcified, for example? Um, all of those things then become even more. Important. Yeah. Good. Thanks for highlighting that. And we're going to dive into some natural factors products here that support endothelial health, heart health in general, cardiovascular health. So tell us real quick, what is the endothelium then? What is that referring to? How important is that in prevention? Mm -hmm. Well, this is really what makes our arteries different from a pipe, you know, that whole clogged pipe analogy. Okay. Our arteries aren't just um, you know, blood vessels that are, are passing blood. But in fact, there is a, an active lining in the blood vessels, this endothelium, it's one cell layer thick, but those cells do so much. They can control the dilation and contraction of the blood vessel yeah. in, that, in that area. They're very involved in repairing and healing damages in that area, which can happen over time and with age. Um, and so the ultimately the endothelium is this living lining and it's what we do to, that will help that um, in terms of heart health, when there is an issue or a buildup somewhere, we might be better off asking, well, why did the endothelium fail us? Why didn't it do its job in keeping that area clean and healthy? What perhaps did it need that it wasn't getting or which factors um, exacerbated um, that or impaired it from being able to do its job? Right. A pipe doesn't have a living, breathing, one cell layer thick membrane where stuff goes in and out through it, correct? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. Right. And has all those different enzymes that mediate its dilation, constriction and all that. So that's very mm -hmm. important to set the stage for for the rest of the discussion today, the endothelial lining, because that gets damaged. We got to really look at is that lining being damaged instead of just total cholesterol levels, correct? A hundred percent. Yeah. There's a few factors here. We know that with age, we tend to lose our collagen levels that declines, mm. and then the um, you know structural components of the arteries can become damaged, and so the body may need to do a little bit of repair. However, if there is also inflammation that impairs the endothelial's proper function, yeah. that repair situation can go sideways. Then you end up with some kind of a blockage, and yes, then that can become calcified. There's ways to prevent that from happening. Uh, keeping the endothelium healthy requires certain nutrients like right. omega-3s, magnesium, vitamin K2. All of those are important. Interesting. You, you mentioned magnesium. Highlight that one real quick because most people, when they, that's very interesting because the endothelial is kind of, it's a muscle, really, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you need it. And so magnesium's involved clearly in muscle health. A lot of people know that, but highlight that real quick because the arteries have muscles on them. Or in them. That's right. Yes. And magnesium, we know, is a wonderful muscle relaxer. Right. It's great for muscle cramps, uh, muscle, you know, twitches. People get like eye twitches, that kind of thing, or any kind of muscle cramps. Well, it's doing the same relaxing effect yeah. on the muscular portions of the arteries as well as in the endothelium. So it has a nice relaxing, dilating effect. Yeah. There's a whole smooth muscle that actually lines that end, the endothelial lining of the arteries. That's really, really cool mm -hmm. stuff there. So that's that's good. Good set the stage here, Dr. Kate, for uh, heart health. Thank you for explaining all that to us. We've discussed PGX in the past, which is a really important product through the history. Even the last six years of us being here at Healthy Habit and with the clinic, a lot of people have benefited from PGX. We know that it supports healthy weight loss, blood sugar levels. What role does it play in cholesterol? Maybe to take a step back, remind us what is PGX? 
Mm -hmm. So PGX stands for polyglycoplex. It's a combination of three soluble fibers that has been studied extensively, primarily in its role as for weight loss and blood sugar control. Now we know that both of those things are important when it comes to heart health. Yeah. Um, but what is often overlooked is the large body of evidence showing that PGX, in fact, does play a role in maintaining healthy cholesterol. Yeah. Um, and it does this by a mechanism that a lot of people aren't aware of. It PGX, the fibers in there are great prebiotics. And so they act on the microbiome, uh, which in turn makes, uh, you know, in the intestines, makes all kinds of beneficial um, things like short chain fatty acids, postbiotics, as they're called. And that yep. ultimately has an effect on maintaining healthy cholesterol. So there's lots of different levels for overall metabolic health. Um, and that, you know, cholesterol benefit is one of them. And we're doing a little screen share here from naturalfactors.com. Here for episode number, let me confirm that, number 97 with Dr. Kate PGX. We have daily singles, little single packets. We have the Ultra Mix Matrix Soft Gels, which looks like it's a bit more potent at 750 milligrams. And then here's the classic with the mulberry. So highlight these for us. Where can someone start? How do they know where to go from here? Mm -hmm. uh, basically, your choice here is between powder or granules which you can uh, sprinkle onto any moist food or mix yeah. into a liquid for example if you want to incorporate it essentially as part of your food and your meals or soft gel capsules for people who just want to you know take a pill that's fine in this case you're still getting the pgx fiber maybe that's more convenient for travel for example yeah. um, i like them both i in some ways maybe tend to lean towards the uh, the granules that you can sprinkle on or mix into your food because uh, people tend to tolerate those better. Of course, this is a fiber. So sometimes in the first few days you're taking it, you're having an adjustment with your microbiome. And I find that adjustment period goes better often with the granules. But there's lots of people who just find the soft gel capsules are so convenient. Uh, take, well, I've seen doses between you know, one, three, even six per meal, depending on the individual and what right. their um, goals are. Interesting. And here's the one with the mulberry. This is the one I've used clinically before, and a lot of customers mm. do like this form. I think this is the original. And PGX, it stands for polyglycoplex, as you were explaining. So highlight that a quick, uh, again, like it's a fiber. And so that's going to help how? Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Well, it's... It's the soluble fiber, three different soluble fibers. They do exist in, in nature, yeah. um, although this combination is unique. And it has been shown to be very uh, viscous. What that means is this fiber, very small amount of it, can absorb a large amount of water. So you can have a small amount of this fiber with your food. Maybe it's in a, a capsule or on yeah. your food. And that will absorb water, which makes you feel full because you are full. You're full of fiber. Um, and then the fiber itself have benefits in terms of um, blood sugar control. And as I mentioned, once it gets down into the intestines, acting as a prebiotic benefits on the microbiome and, and also the metabolism. So it really is working on oh. lots of different levels. Thank you for highlighting that. Again, PGX, WellBedX, through the WellBedX line. They even have a berberine through that line, and more, a couple more, I'm pretty sure. But uh, these are that's for the kind of metabolism line. Is that a good way to view it, the WellBedX family of products would that cover then like blood sugar blood pressure metabolic health in general exactly it's particularly targeted around support for healthy blood sugar okay. uh, but certainly that goes hand in hand with as you, you know metabolic all kinds of metabolic illness and conditions right. um everybody in general benefits from um you know making sure their blood sugar is stable and not fluctuating throughout the day which is really what drives cravings and high insulin and, and those kinds of problems Amazing, folks. If you're just tuning in, Dr. Kate is with us, and meaning if you just kind of walked into the store, because this is playing live, too, as people are shopping here at Healthy Habit. We're talking with Dr. Kate Rayom here for episode number 97 of the Healthy Habit podcast, and that was PGX. Now I want to really see how CoQ10 can relate with this. That's an important cardiovascular nutrient. You mentioned some people are just thrown on a statin if their blood sugar was high once or close to being high. Some people, it's not even flagged high in the blood work and they're still giving it. So highlight the role of CoQ10 and all that. Mm -hmm. Well, we know uh, CoQ10, of course, is an antioxidant. So it's something that can help the cholesterol we talked about earlier, even the 
LDL, so-called bad cholesterol, doesn't really become bad until it becomes oxidized. Oh. So this is something that can help with that. As a matter of fact, a, a meta-analysis has shown that uh, coenzyme Q10 will help with lowering the lipoprotein A. We talked about is that oxidized cholesterol. So that's very important right. in and of itself. Even more important, um, as you mentioned, Dr. Dan, for people who are put on cholesterol-lowering medications, those, as part of how they work, um, as a side effect, impair or block the body's own production of CoQ10. Uh -huh. And so you're trying to do something good for your heart health, supposedly, you know, by lowering your cholesterol, but then you're impairing your body's ability to protect the cholesterol you have from becoming oxidized. So super, super important for people who are taking statin medications um, to be aware of this. Uh, and and be taking CoQ10, you know, if you're not sure, speak to your pharmacist about it. Right. But it is something extremely important in that instance. And we got another screen share coming up with CoQ10. Uh, you mentioned it protects the cholesterol from being oxidized, which is a huge, very important role. And we can see the whole family here of CoQ10 options. We have the 100 milligram, we have a 200 milligram soft gel, we even have a 50, and then even the ubiquinol form, so which are a bit, these are more expensive. This is the active form of CoQ10. So tell us how to differentiate between these. We've had customers in the store standing in front of the section here at CoQ10 and asking us, which one do I go with? Yeah, and you don't want to have to have a, a degree in biochemistry to shop for supplements, but it when it comes to these two, you know, so basically, CoQ10 in the body and in nature exists in two forms, ubiquinone, ubiquinol. Yeah. One has an electron, uh, one has room to receive an electron. The, the point in terms of shoppers is um, the ubiquinol, it is has been shown to be um, more effective. And I would say roughly, depending on the studies, you look at 25 to 40% more effective, but okay. it's also roughly that much more expensive. So if you're on a budget, you can get the benefits you want with a regular CoQ10 ubiquinone. Uh, yeah. You might need to take a little more. If you uh, have more of a budget for your supplements, ubiquinol, you are getting more bang for your buck. It's a uh, more effective um, free radical quencher, yeah. uh, an electron donor. But um, that's sort of, you know, to explain that. So if a cost is an option, go for the ubiquinol. If yeah. not, you know, lots and lots of research about the standard ubiquinone form of CoQ10. And then highlight that real quick. Ubiquinol is the active version. Ubiquinone mm -hmm. isn't ready yet necessarily. It still has to get converted to the active form before it starts having all the benefits in the body. Is that correct? Exactly, which will happen yeah. in the body. Um, but, uh, you know, for people who have specific health concerns, maybe somebody who's been uh, taking a statin medication. Uh, and again, if cost is, isn't a concern, this ubiquinol is uh, a little bit more expensive, but it's also more effective. Amazing. Again, ubiquinol, you have the 200, 100. This is the active one. It's ready to go. Ubiquinone is another option. If you're more on a budget, you're still getting incredible health benefits. There's so much research to back CoQ10. So critical player on up Dr. Kate's sleeve when it comes to protecting the heart health up there with magnesium. We talked about regulating the blood sugar. I want to highlight that real quick one more time. What's the connection there between blood sugar and the endothelial lining, like heart protecting against heart attacks, blood pressure? Is it the sugar, if it's around the bloodstream too long, it just starts kind of hacking away, damaging that endothelium? How does that work? There's so many, it works on so many different levels or creates problems yeah. on so many different levels. Um, high blood sugar tends to mean higher insulin levels. When insulin right. levels are high, that impairs the body's ability to have a healthy endothelium. Um, when blood sugar is high, you end up getting what's called glycation or, or ultimately um, tissues and, and even cells like red blood cells become kind of yeah. coated in that sugar. And, and that then is is problematic and can impair um, the cardiovascular system, again, the endothelial system. So maintaining a healthy blood sugar, although we think of that as yeah. separate from heart health, it's a very important part of heart health. Right. And well, BEDX, though, that line, it even says on the PGX bottle, it's a glucose management system. So thanks for highlighting exactly. that product as well. Mm -hmm. And especially if you're on a statin, you want to start researching CoQ10 and its connection with statins, how they get depleted too. So uh, I think we have time for, I want to highlight berberine as well, since we did mention that. And that's that can be taken with PGX. Have you done that, used it in that way? 
It can be taken. Now, both PGX and berberine are for supporting healthy blood sugar. So for right. somebody who's just starting out, you might want to try one or the other okay. to see the effect on the blood sugar first before combining them. And um, they can be safely taken together, but taking them both together at, at once all to start may change the blood sugar too quickly. So, you know, usually one or the other, we know that there's been a huge trend around berberine for good reason, right. lots and lots of research around it uh, and its ability to support healthy blood sugar. And um, that, you know, the word is getting out on that right now, uh, yeah. which is good news. And, and it, it works by a completely different mechanism uh, than the PGX fiber that I mentioned before, but it also does lots of good things once again in the microbiome yeah. Um, and that's where the benefits start. Got it. So then let's do a step back again. This this in, very important question, when is cholesterol a problem? You know, people, they've had their lipid panels checked. How, does, how do they know? Like, when should they start getting concerned? What's the good take home there? Like, how do we know when it's getting oxidized? How do they know that in a, in a typical blood panel? What else mm -hmm. should the doctor be checking? You mentioned it, but it's a good recap. Definitely. So as part of that uh, cholesterol panel, when the cholesterol test is being done to also include LPA or lipoprotein okay. A, which is a measure of uh, oxidized cholesterol. Um, and it wouldn't hurt to have, uh, you know, something like a measure of um, inflammation also being checked with okay. that along with that panel. Um, that's helpful as well. Um, but that really is when we need to become concerned. Yes, if, well, if cholesterol is extremely high and the person has all kinds of other risk factors, you know, maybe smoking, high blood pressure, overweight, family history, well, yes, then all of those things need to be addressed. Right. Um, but for individuals who's only otherwise healthy, has no other risk factors, uh, slightly elevated cholesterol, especially if this oxidized test comes out normal, uh, then maybe not as much cause for concern. Right. And then I think it's important you mentioned this, that people remember that it's not just about even if it's normal, even if your lipid panel comes back perfectly well within range, still add on some of those other markers, correct? Yes, because you still want to make sure that your endothelium is healthy. So things yeah. like omega-3s, magnesium, uh, keeping your blood sugar healthy, all of those things are still important because, right. uh, yeah, we do want to know that cholesterol isn't the only thing to focus on with heart health. And then the last, we'll finish off here highlighting theracurmin because, you know, can this play a role in cardiovascular health? People think of it just for pain if their knee is sore. Oh, then they think turmeric, curcumin. Can, mm -hmm. can curcumin, turmeric play a role in cardiovascular protection? Definitely. You're right. We tend to think of uh, curcumin as a wonderful natural inflammatory, which it is, but yeah. inflammation is important for more than just uh, aches and pains or sore joints, it is definitely, you know, fundamental to the um, heart health process that we yeah. want to, um, you know, keep inflammation at a healthy level. And it's also, curcumin is also a fantastic antioxidant. So again, protecting your cholesterol uh, from becoming the damaging type of cholesterol. And so it really does, you know, it's like a one-two punch. It has uh, a number of uh, benefits on different levels. And it's interesting, I was researching that curcumin, turmeric can also, either of them, both of them have been shown to do this, can help with met metabolism and weight loss, which is a key driver in, in this heart, of the heart disease epidemic and the rates of heart attacks that are happening. We're also in an obesity epidemic. So mm -hmm. how important is that to get the weight under control, to take pressure off the arteries and the heart? Uh, so important. There is that, that physical aspect of carrying extra weight is literally more work on the body, yeah. on the blood pressure, on the heart. And so there's just that almost, you could say, mechanical aspect of it. Um, but then, of course, with a lot of extra weight, the metabolism tends to change in ways that can predispose us to more cardiovascular issues. And so that's important. Uh, and, you know, surprisingly, studies have shown that even Losing a small amount of weight, even losing yes. just five percent of your exactly. body weight, yep. can really lower your risk factors for all these kinds of conditions. I was mentioning, I think it was with a previous guest recently, that even like two pounds of weight loss starts mm -hmm. taking points, multiple points off the blood pressure. Yep. Is that what you're referring to? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So people think, oh, they need to lose it all, or they need to lose yeah. hundred pounds. But even that, even that, just that five percent yep. has been shown to make a meaningful difference in health. Amazing. Dr. Kate Rayom's with us here today. We're talking heart health, natural factors. 
We've highlighted PGX. We just mentioned Thera Kierman, which we'll finish off on that note. Magnesium, CoQ10 as well. We can. We need a full four hours here with Dr. Kate to talk about the heart and all the different options we can we can use. But we will have you back on, Dr. Kate. So this was a good starting point to help people start taking care of their health. And we can give basically the time we have left. We can do a recap here. We'll finish off with your final thoughts. What should somebody know if they're shopping in the store right now? And we're talking move over cholesterol and heart health. Mm -hmm. That even if you haven't been told you have high cholesterol, that um, heart disease is still the number one killer of men and women in North America. And so Mm -hmm. still worth paying attention to your heart health with nutrients like omega-3s and magnesium and, uh, you know, things that help the, the endothelium as well as keeping the blood sugar level stable, things like PGX, things like berberine. And on a great note, I think to end with, studies have shown that laughter is helpful for the endothelium. Okay. And so uh, if you can work that in as well, then uh, it helps to keep your endothelium healthy. Do you have any thoughts on deep breathing and stimulating that vagus nerve? What role can that play too? People, most people are shallow breathers. They never get mm-hmm. that full inhale and exhale throughout the day. And what do you think about that? The benefits of that in terms of uh, endothelium, brain health, even literally changing the structure of the brain in a beneficial right. way, uh, some of the research on that is remarkable. It's such a simple thing that kind of resets us and can actually make a difference. Well, thank you for coming on today for episode number 97, Dr. Kate, all the way from Canada. Appreciate you coming Mm -hmm. on, and I look forward to our next discussion. Thanks, Dr. Dayan. Take care. Happy Heart Health Month.